Good evening and welcome to the CAPS Forum on Ethics and Public Policy. My name is Greg Jarrett. I represent the Walter H. CAPS Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. Last winter, uh, we celebrated, we recognized the 50th anniversary of the oil spill in Santa Barbara, you might recall. Um, it was a small oil spill by today's standards, but um, um, it really made a difference in terms of our awareness of the situations. And um, it's no coincidence that this fall, um, the department or the program of environmental studies is celebrating their 50th anniversary. You know, coincidence? Um, hmm. Um, in any case, uh, we'd like to thank environmental studies for co-sponsoring this event. Um, and we'd also like to thank um, Dr. David Pello for, um, who's chair of environmental studies for uh, inspiring us to invite uh, Sarah Ray down. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, tonight we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Ray. She's a rising young star in environmental studies and environmental humanities. She's a um, professor and program leader of the new environmental studies program at Humboldt State University. Uh, Dr. Ray's interests include environmental justice, uh, critical human geography, disability studies, and issues of power, identity, discourse of nature. Uh, she's the co-editor of three books, uh, Critical North's Space Nature Theory, Disability Studies and the Environmental Humanities, and Latinx Environmentalisms, Place, Justice, and the Decolonial. She's the author of two books, um, The Ecological Other, Environmental Exclusion in uh, American Culture. Not everybody who's sort of interested in the environment uh, is like a middle-aged bearded white guy. Um, um, and tonight, I think we'll get a little bit of a sneak preview of her forthcoming book, uh, which is called A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. Are you feeling the climate anxiety? Um, a Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming uh, Planet. Tonight's talk is called Coming of Age at the End of the World, an Existential Toolkit for, the, for you all, the climate generation. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Ray. Thank you very much. Oh, Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Jarrett. And thanks for welcoming me. Thanks to Environmental Studies for helping to host and the Walter Cap Center. It's really an honor to be here and pleasure. I grew up in Los Angeles, so this is not too far from where I used to do my maybe not so great 16 year old drives up here for Santa Barbara culture. Um, so now after a detour, I um, got my PhD at University of Oregon and then spent my first four years as a program leader of environmental studies and geography at the University of Alaska Southeast in Juneau, Alaska. And then um, took up the helm at Humboldt State, which had just started an environmental studies program. They had had a lot of environmental programs there. You might be familiar that they have a lot of environmental science programs, but they had just thought maybe they wanted to do something a little different, um, capture some of the students who I think they thought didn't like science so much. Um, but I like to think of environmental studies as doing something also uh, really valuable and important besides just science too. So they developed an environmental studies program. I've been leading that for um, almost six years. So uh, from the perspective of program leadership and teaching and developing curriculum for environmental studies students for now 10 years, it's hard to believe. Um, I have changed a lot of what I thought of what an educator is supposed to be doing, and I wanna tell you a little bit about that story today. So, I have a clicker, I'm so excited, it works. Um, this is the talk today I'm gonna to give today is uh, based on and kind of background story to my book that's coming out, Earth Day 2020, and in sh shameless self-promotion fashion, there are some discount flyers in the back um, on your way out if you're interested. It's available for pre-order. Um, so I want to tell a little bit of, uh, today about what drew me to think about this as a book that needed to be written and who is it for and why, um, why you might want to read it and why we need an existential toolkit, um, which is this field guide. So just a talk outline. 
Who are the climate generation? I'm going to just kind of tease apart the title of the, of the talk. Who are the climate generation? What does it mean to come of age at the end of the world? Why does the climate generation, and maybe the rest of us, need an existential toolkit? And some examples of the tools from the toolkit. So that's where I'm going to get into the weeds on what kinds of things I'm going to be writing about in the book, but without actually you know, reading from the chapters or anything. OK, so just for scaling out a little bit, um, how many of you guys think that uh, you are experiencing something that maybe feels like climate anxiety? A little bit, OK. OK, so it's a new vernacular we have for different shades of anxiety and grief and mourning and loss that have to do with the environment that's um, becoming more and more popular, and people are starting to even know about what that is and, and put words to it. Um, so that's been something that's happening in, in recent years. It's pretty new. Um, so this is not just something that uh, afflicts the climate generation, though. I'm going to start a little bit with thinking about how this is being expressed in lots of different places, and then focus in a little bit more about what makes uh, the climate generation or young people's experience of climate anxiety particularly unique. So climate grief is pervasive. Um, does anyone recognize this person, David Buckel? Has anybody heard the name Dave Buckel? This was the um, man who was a, a gay rights lawyer in New York who immolated himself about a year and a half ago. Did anybody remember this in the news? It was proclaimed as the first climate suicide, which of course one would argue there's been many climate suicides related to issues of drought in Australia or um, the Green Revolution in India, uh, lots of other things we could call climate suicides. But in the US context, it was kind of hailed as this first moment where um, he actually left a suicide note that said something to the effect of, I am dousing myself in gasoline and burning myself to death because I want to illustrate and bring attention to the fact that this is what society is doing to itself. So that kind of powerful symbolism and extreme um, sort of taking climate anxiety to, to the real extreme, but um, I'm not sure about you all, I don't want to speak for you all, but what I am feeling from my students and from the climate generation really is at this level um, for lots of students, and so I take it, I take it quite seriously. Um, this is, um, there's research now is becoming really, uh, there's a lot of really exciting research on the connections between mental health and climate change. There's been the development of a new um, organization called the Climate Psychology Alliance. There's all kinds of books that are coming out on the intersections of mental health and climate change, which are super interesting. And this person's book I read sort of like from front to back in my moment of discovery because I was so excited that somebody was writing so deeply about this when I really shifted gears towards trying to do a lot of research on psychology. Um, there are certainly um, these two examples of journalists. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Chris Jordan's Albatross Midway film where he, pictured, he took pictures of all the albatross, the dead albatross with the plastic in the stomachs. Is anyone familiar with at least a picture of that? That's sort of like an iconic picture of what plastic's doing to um, biodiversity and sea life. Um, Chris Jordan is a great example of somebody who after that film, he went into a severe depression and couldn't produce and couldn't function and had to really figure out what the heck this new sort of anxiety he was feeling was. Um, has anybody seen this film by Josh Fox? How to, and then the title's really long and I never remember it. Has anybody, has anybody seen this? I see a couple of nodded heads. The sort of framing device of this really fantastic film is how he's trying to negotiate climate anxiety and eco-grief when he talks about how um, the fracking in his own backyard of, of Pennsylvania is affecting the river there. And um, he then goes and explores uh, other folks around the whole world and how they're negotiating um, what Glenn Albrecht has called soul nostalgia. And Glenn Albrecht has um, made a whole book, this has just come out this year, on all the different kind of new language that we can have to talk about issues of climate anxiety and eco-grief. And he's actually coined a term called soul nostalgia, which is the experience of the loss of your environment without you actually moving, right? So. Uh, we often talk about homesickness as you being displaced from your home and having that, um, that sense of mourning or loss from your environment. But he's trying to talk about what happens to the environment where you, while you're still there when it's degraded so badly. And so um, these are uh, examples of, I don't know if anybody's familiar with how this is manifesting in pop culture. Is anybody interested in Big Little Lies or is this just my own generation? Okay, we got some Big Little Lies fans, like second season of Big Little Lies. Um, we have this young child who's like nine years old in the film 
having, starting to have panic attacks because of climate anxiety, and they actually call it that in the film. And I think to myself, yes, every time I talk about this, people want to talk to me about their young kids. What are their young kids are coming and home and talking about this stuff, and what should they do? And I think, oh my god. Times have changed. They didn't talk about that when I was in elementary school. Um, and so I can talk about that so at some other point, but I do think age-appropriate climate discussions is an important detail. Um, so I think it's funny how it's manifesting in pop culture. And of course, this is not just an affliction of the privileged. Um, climate anxiety also applies to thinking about what's happening in low-lying nations where sea level rise is actually taking over whole lands and cultures. Um, and this is the Pacific climate warriors, which are featured in Josh Fox's film, um, really trying to make a point that they are not victims of this thing. They are acting. They are trying to fight what's happening. And so Josh Fox covers them as an example of resilience um, of people who are finding agency despite uh, having been having experiences that are happening to them that are outside of their, they're not causing it, right? Climate change is not something they're doing to themselves. So, and this is examples of permafrost. This is a great example of solastalgia where the permafrost in Shishmaref and Kivalina Islands off the coast of Alaska, where indigenous communities have lived for millennia, are now having to be forcibly removed onto the mainland because the permafrost of their islands is, is uh, melting. So just some examples of climate anxiety kind of out there in the world as a sort of backdrop of, of happening to a lot of different people. But I want to focus now a little bit more on how this is shaping up in a younger generation and why the climate generation ought to be given this name, why we ought to think about climate anxiety in terms of generational difference. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about why I would do that. Well, I, I've been leading this program for 10 years and working with students for a long time. And I used to think my role as an educator in environmental studies, especially with a focus on environmental justice, was to kind of enlighten students about their complicity in environmental justice problems around the world, teach them words like structural violence and externalities and environmental racism, and kind of shake them into this like awareness, right? And that sort of is reinforced by most environmental education. The sort of implicit argument of even environmental science classes is, you know, wake up students, the world is burning, the world, your house is on fire, as Greta Thunberg would say, and you know you guys got to get plugged into doing something about it. How many of you guys have taken a class where that seems to be the subtext of what the syllabus is doing? A couple of you, yeah, right. right. This, this is why I'm now on this campaign because I feel like this is a really old school way of teaching, and it's no longer appropriate for the climate generation. Um, so about five years ago, my students started to bring the climate anxiety into the classroom and started to disrupt that what I thought of my role as, as an educator and I had to kind of put aside what I was doing and make the space for this stuff to happen because otherwise it would spill out over into office hours and late night emails and it was really starting to overwhelm me. And so I, had, I started to have this experience of climate anxiety deferral or secondary or what trauma scholars would call uh, vicarious trauma or something, right? Um, and of course I was thinking to myself, maybe I should be reckoning with this too. Maybe I should be taking my students more seriously and thinking about what the existential threat of this really is, even though I was teaching it and you know, I was immersed in it all the time. Um, so I started to shift thinking about, um, I was really doing research on and teaching around issues of environmental justice, and I started to realize that I needed to, if I was going to cope with what was happening in my classrooms, that I was going to have to dive into a really different area of research. And um, so I started to get really interested in psychology, pedagogy, which is theory of teaching, theory of learning, the role of emotions in learning. I realized I had never been taught the role of emotions in learning, and social emotional development and learning is a mainstay of, of child development, but we give up on that on in the higher education level. We literally expect students to come in as empty heads that sit on their desks and take in information and deal with, leave their emotional lives at the door, ignoring entirely all of the science that shows how important emotion is to the ability to learn and retain information, much less anything else in the world like we might want to maybe have students be engaged citizens in the world and go and fix the climate problems that we're talking about. Or we might want them to you know, get a job or graduate or maybe come to class, right? So things like coming to class became a problem because of climate anxiety, much less any of the other hopes I might have had for students. So I really had to change my gears. Um, and so that kind of is the background for thinking about who are these students and what is their problems and what are they coming with and how can I help them with the limited skills that I have? I'm not a therapist. 
I'm an environmental humanities and justice scholar, so how can I could deploy these tools to, to support students? And also the planet, you know? I kind of felt like the planet needed it too. Um, okay, so what, what are students learning in college and what are they even learning at, like in AP environmental science classes or even by their families and friends in their communities? Um, this is what's happening. They're learning that there's no easy solutions. So this sort of silver bullet idea that we're gonna you know, do solar panels across the planet and that's how it's gonna solve, they already come in knowing it's not, e it's not gonna be an easy solution and they, they don't even know which direction to go. So they feel already very disempowered. Um, many students come into school thinking they're going to become educators and that it just, if we just educated people more on these problems, then we would, that would translate into better political will to solve the problems. And it comes to find out that that's not how, that's not how change happens and power is working in all these screwed up ways and it becomes very disenchanting for students. Um, all of the adults in the room, like the expert scientists and politicians that we're counting on to fix these problems, are in fact being paid not to fix these problems. And so that really is like an, a, a moment of awakening. Oh, capitalism, right. <laughs> we can't, can't do the existing institutions. As David Pellow talks about, the state itself we can't rely on, right? Um, nature is a social construction. This is something that's pretty unique, I think, to the humanities for teaching students that um, there's no real such thing as sort of nature out there untouched. It's, you know, we, we refract our definitions of nature and the environment through very human lenses of what we want it to be, and it means different things to different people depending on your power and positionality and that sort of thing. And so this notion that, um, you know, we're living in, a, in a, an environment that's absolutely always already thoroughly imbricated in human life is a real kind of, for many students, a real disenchanting moment too. Um, this one always bothers students a lot, right? That your individual actions that you've been caring about since you were in like ninth, seventh grade or nine years old, like the girl in the show, um, may not matter that much, right? The recycling disenchantment moment is really a bummer for students because they've dedicated their whole lives to this. Has anybody had that experience where they were like, I recycle and ride my bike and I got to college and I learned that that's not gonna do anything? Anybody? Yeah, that's really awful. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have that particular disenchantment, but I see it in my students, because I never, I still drive a car, I'm terrible. Um, on, also, this one, this one's a particular perspective from environmental justice, which is that we can't solve the climate crisis without addressing inequality. And I think we'll see, this will come up a lot in some later comments I wanna make, that um, many students would like to just use the urgency of the climate crisis to kind of bully through uh, climate policies. And one of the things that I want to talk about is the urgency narrative has the effect, can, can have the effect of uh, foreclosing more just or socially just solutions to climate change. And so this particular insight has to kind of, we still haven't quite uh, cope with it yet. And finally, this one's particularly difficult. If we are in America, uh, we are complicit in the exploitation of, the, of others in the planet, and that I think is the pervasive complicity issue is a real bummer for a lot of students too. So this is kind of the, you know, this is what young people are learning, even sometimes before they even get to college, but certainly it's stuff that they're learning in college. And I didn't, I was not prepared at all for what this would feel like for students and how it would feel like all of these rugs were being pulled out from underneath them, and that the, that the results of this, the result of all of this is that um, students don't come to class, right? <laughs> they turn out and go back out the door and say, I don't think I want to do that depressing stuff. I'm going to go do kinesiology or something. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening. Sorry, I'm moving on to the next slide here in a second. Okay, so how does this all this make young people feel? Well, um, I started to realize I could sort of predict this journey was happening, like depending on the student's body language, they'd walk into my office and I'd say, oh, okay, you are in, in nihilism now you're ready for the next thing, you know? There was this kind of almost predictable journey, like maybe Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey or The Stages of Grief or The Ladder of White Privilege, right? There's all these great, great metaphors for the stages of coming of, coming of age that um, happen in different fields. And I thought, oh, we need to have an existential journey for environmental studies students. Um, they come in idealistic, they move through these sort of stages, um, the guilt part also is connected to um, 
a little bit of like what I call eco white fragility too. So there's kind of a, a little mixture of identity issues going on there too. Um, at some point after nihilism, one of my students said, I think I'm in the baking cookie stage. And this was when she retreated to her kitchen and started bringing in lots of cookies to classes because she just couldn't come to class without them. And um, I wanted to put it up there because it's actually pretty important. Um, we often think about these emotional stages or also other actions we can do in the world as being of value if they have sort of a direct deliverable or they're really obviously instrumental. And it turns out things like creating community and feeding stomachs and that sort of thing um, is a highly valuable thing that we often disregard. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, but the baking cookies part really helped all of our classmates walk across that graduation stage. Um, ultimately, in all the research I did, I was trying to think um, the main purpose of our classes seems to be to tell students to feel nihilistic and guilty and awful. Um, and it turns out, as I was doing this research and also experiencing in the classroom, that those emotional states or those affective states are not really good student learning outcomes in college. Does anyone know what that, what that language is, student learning outcome? It's like that thing that your professors put on your syllabi that says, you will learn this in this class, right? And they're always really like, they look really awesome. They're like, I will have a really great understanding of how economics plays into environmental problems or something like that, right? And I realized that there was a subtext or a, like a, a underneath the layer, there was this existential student learning outcomes that we were um, not attending to in our syllabi in our classrooms. And so I started to think, what is the existential student learning outcomes I want my students to have? And so in the research, I kept thinking, well, is it hope? Hope seems like a good one, right? There was sort of like, a hope phase for a while. People were like brokering hope everywhere. You know, you go to, um, you talk to, you listen to any climate podcast or you even go into your classes and sometimes your professors will give you like one last day on hope, right? And they're like, okay, now you can go off and have summer, have fun. Do you know, have, you know what I'm talking about? Like Rebecca Solnit or something at the very end? No, just a little something to like, lift you up after all that awful stuff. And so this turns out that this is a trope. I started researching this, like everywhere people were writing about this, that there's a trope of ending on hope. And I thought, okay, well, what's wrong with hope? And so I started to do all this reading on hope and it turned out hope wasn't really what I think we wanted students to get to. And I discuss all the limitations of hope in the book and I won't go into the details now, but it turns out hope doesn't actually give students any sense that they're fixing the problems. It often defers um, the fixing of the problems. And so it turned out that as I did all this research, actually efficacy turned out to be way more important. Efficacy being the students, a young person's ability to feel like they can make a difference. Well, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but there are a lot of things standing in the way of young people feeling that they can make a difference. And that's, I mean, you probably feel it, right? Like I'm too small, the problem's too big, just for one, right? Um, and then I, what I was also finding in research too was that a sense of community around addressing problems and efficacy was also super important, which is not something I was really raised with myself. And so it was all sort of scratching my head and peculiar research to find out that actually this kind of American myth of the individual that we are all kind of operating as isolated islands um, and that our actions, whether they're good or bad, won't have any consequence beyond my own kind of sphere um, was really interesting to me. I was starting to really cr criticize the American myth of the individual around this because I had really been raised with that, right? I really thought I was on my own. I have, you know, got my own thing going on. I, I'm about my own goals and achievements and consequences. Um, but the problem with that is that it turns out dollar for dollar, and I, this was something I was really surprised to find in the research, that um, things, infrastructure like bridges, good bridges and good roads and good highways and good dikes and good levees that might withstand and build a community's resilience against things like extreme storms, right? We think about, when we think about the word resilience, that's usually what we think about, right? Like this, you know, it's got a really good levy, it's not gonna break, right? Um, turns out that dollar for dollar, community trust is actually more valuable and important for a community's ability to recover itself than that infrastructure. And when I learned that, I was just blown away. I was really blown away. And you can, you can really see that story being told beautifully in that Josh Fox film with the community after Hurricane Sandy. 
Um, so in the end, I wanted to add efficacy with community and think about this. So the existential best student learning outcome is something like resilience, okay? And there's some problems with that term too. And I do want to, you know, put that out there that I can see some of the limitations of that term. But for sure, that's kind of the direction I wanted to be thinking about going. So um, this is the student experience ideal. But this is what, this is a Valentine, the student, the group of students all made for me. Do you remember that advertisement, this is your brain on drugs with the fried eggs? Okay. So there was this moment in class when I was realizing that this despair and like the rugs were all getting pulled out and all those things they were learning, complicity and all that was really like killing the class, right? There was an affective deadening going on. And I sort of said, you guys, this is like your brain on our class. This is the brain on drugs. This is your brain on learning this stuff. It's, it's, it is really hard and it is not pleasant stuff. And I didn't really understand the resistance to the discomfort issue, right? But not attending to it also was undermining our success. And so this was really, I just love this. I don't know, maybe my morbid um, aesthetics, but I thought, yeah, that's kind of what it feels like for students, right? Or another one of my students um, wrote a final paper about her, how she internalized um, climate anxiety and what she was learning um, about her impact on the planet in terms of gender, um, beauty expectations, and that sort of thing. And I thought this was a very powerful essay she wrote, and I'm just pulling from it. Having struggled with an eating disorder in high school, I sought recovery by ensuring that the food I ate was as real as possible, believing that it would improve my relationship with food as an avenue for activism, right? So instead of her control over food as a form of control or whatever other psychological reasons that she would have around having an eating disorder, she then trans replaced it with her activism, right? That this was gonna be her way of being a good environmentalist. When grocery shopping or preparing meals, thoughts fired off so quickly in my mind that I sometimes thought I would over, it would overheat. That's the experience of anxiety, right? That's how it feels. Some of us might have some familiarity with that feeling. Um, overwhelmed with the inescapable reality that almost every product I looked at somehow contributed to ecological, social, and personal health problems, my mind would fall into a swirl of panic over the choices at hand. Sometimes I would leave without food altogether, deciding it was better to go hungry than to make the wrong decision. And despite my great hunger and anxiety, this seemed perfectly justified based on the narrative I had been fed. To disappear, to become smaller, was to save the world and be beautiful. And so you can sort of go back to thinking about um, David Buckel, that the logical kind of implicit message that, we're, that the mainstream environmental movement has been saying for some time is to reduce your impact on the planet. There's no message saying out there, no, the planet needs you. You actually need to be here to do some work, right? I'm going to try to get help. Oh, uh, okay, so, um, so that's, that's when you think about the climate generation and how they're coping with climate anxiety. But maybe it's really helpful, too, when I started to research just in general demographics of Generation Z. Um, and so I'm going to put up some statistics about Gen Z that are pretty depressing, actually. So you add that on to the climate anxiety, you can really see how you have like a perfect storm of issues going on here. Um, some of these are good though, right? More than any generation, you care greatly about climate change and social justice and you see the link between the two. So this is something I think is a real opportunity. Um, you're financially insecure. If you're in college, you will owe on average $40,000 by the time you graduate. You're the first generation that's more likely to be less well off than your parents. You're raised with smartphones, social media, and unprecedented internet access to global networks and information. Again, a really great opportunity that makes the generation very unique. Um, although you're more connected, you're also more lonely, suicidal, and depressed than previous generations. And I'm not just making this up. This is like, you research this stuff, right? Your generation is also the most ethnically diverse in US history. And you're the most stressed, but also the least likely to vote which considering that something like 80% of young people of voting age are deeply and profoundly concerned about climate change, it's pretty astonishing to think what a voting block like that might do for um, getting politicians to care about climate change. So um, that's just about, I just wanted to put this up there to say, this is also happening, right? Even if you don't care about the environment, this is also happening. It's a lot, right? And that, it was really enlightening to me to realize who was walking in my door. It wasn't the same student from 10 years ago. So the second part of this talk is about 
what does it mean to come, and to come of age at the end of the world? And you know where I'm going. I'm going to kind of, I'm doing this narrative thing where I'm going to go sink real low. We're going down now, right? Um, you feel like there is no good way you can have, no good thing you can do for the planet. There's only impact, right? Everything is framed in terms of impact. The ecological footprint exercise, you all familiar with that? Yeah, that's like a thing. Many years, in the same vein I was telling you before that I felt like my job was to teach students how terrible they were. The ecological footprint has a great, does a great job at doing that, doesn't it? <laughs> that's awful. Um, you have, you, there's a lot of feeling like humanity sucks. Humanity is bad for the planet. And of course, this is a particularly troubling one because this doesn't account for the various ways that different people are either good or bad for the planet. Different communities can, in fact, work very well with the environment and that there are particular kinds of social structures that put humans into a, a conflict relationship with the environment that doesn't have to do with humanity as an inherent thing. Um, the problems are too big and interconnected and you're too small to fix them. So that's like the main message I think many students get out of college, right? Yeah, it's too big. I can't do anything. The apocalypse is on the horizon if it's not already here. So increasingly, especially in California, students are experiencing the apocalypse, right? Fires, droughts, that sort of thing. Rising sea levels is happening. We just talked about rising sea levels in Humboldt Bay just this week in my class. Um, Things like the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the COP25 that's happening right now in Madrid um, are telling us things like we're past the point of no return. So there's another reason why, you, why young people don't feel like they can do anything about it. It's easier to imagine apocalypse than a post-fossil fuel society. Now sociologists have shown us this. I found this really amazing when I heard it, that if we can't imagine a future, past fossil fuels, we are more likely to like imagine ourselves in the end of Terminator. Remember that movie? It was like nothing, all nuked. That's pretty sad. Um, the way I really had my first insight to this experience or this, this, this uh, truth is when I did an exercise with my class where I asked them to do a visualization exercise and I had them close their eyes and I read um, a letter from a future person, a young girl from, a hypothetical speculative young girl from 2050 um, who was thanking the class for all the work they had done to bring about this wonderful society they lived in. And I asked the students to think about, what, what did you do? What is this person thanking you for? What's this future that you've helped create? And when my students couldn't tell me about this future that they could envision or what their role was in it, I was actually mad at them. I was like, you guys are just so unimaginative. You're just, it's like the worst excuse I ever heard to like not step up to the plate. Lazy, right? And then it took me like a couple of weeks. I was like, this is actually really heartbreaking. <laughs> That's what's really going on. It's heartbreaking. They couldn't imagine a future. They couldn't imagine what role they might play in manifesting a good future. They couldn't answer the question, what would it take to thrive in a climate change world? Which is a quote from a book by Adrienne Marie Brown called Emergent Strategy. And when she asked that question in this book, I thought, oh my God. Nobody thinks about thriving in a climate change future. Why don't we? We should. Your life course will be radically different than previous generations. And that's something that I think that the youth climate movement is really showing us now. They're saying, you're going to retire. That's how you're going to die. I'm going to die from climate change. Or increasingly, many, many young people are thinking already about not bringing children into the world. Not because of the reason my generation might have chosen not to have children, which is too much population growth or something like that, but because they think it's cruel to bring a child into a world that will be this way. That is a very different reason to not have a child. It's fine, I'm not against, I'm not for having children. I'm not suggesting that we have to solve the climate crisis with heteronormativity or anything like that. I'm just saying it is an indication of the existential heft of, of this new moment we're in. And of course, this kind of notion that you should erase yourself, right, as my student before wrote about. And all this is happening, meanwhile, when your prefrontal cortexes are not developed, right? It's like extreme feelings, very little self-regulation possibilities here, amygdalas running rampant. I had to do research on that because I was like, oh, right, that's happening. 
I feel like it's happening to me too all the time. But we'll come back to this. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, one of my chapters in my book is called, uh, it really is helpful to know what the science is on psychology and your brain to know what's happening to all of this information we're getting. OK, so one of the essays I like to teach by Michael Manier, it's called Teaching for Turbulence, um, kind of hits on this. And it really put me to the challenge. He wrote, Left unchallenged, this urgency plus inability equation can overwhelm students with a sense of hopelessness and despair. And I thought, left unchallenged, OK, how can we challenge it? What are we supposed to do to challenge it? So that's what I, that's what I kind of set out to do with thinking about my book. Um, so the third part, why do we need an existential toolkit? Well, one of the things that we don't think about very often is that the solutions to the problems that we're having is not about more, getting more data or more information. And this might feel really intuitive to you now, but only like a year or two ago, there was a sense of climate change is uncertain. We need to have more knowledge and information. Get the data. Why, the way we're going to solve the debates about climate change versus climate denialism is just more information, right? That, that was the argument about like a year ago or two years ago. But increasingly, people are calling for more attention to recognizing how important feelings and affect and values and will are for affecting climate actions. Um, some are calling this strategy deep adaptation as opposed to or in addition to strategies of mitigation. Some are calling this interior sustainability. So using this notion of sustainability, which we think about as like buildings and energy sources and composting and zero waste. And they're thinking, well, what happens when you talk about interior sustainability as equally as important as that? And so I really am enjoying this kind of language which re refocuses thinking about what kinds of resources we need interiorly to do this work. Um, another reason why we need an existential toolkit, um, just kind of a point, I have had this conversation a lot with people saying, you know, you're, you're turning to the interior, you're giving up on the external, right? You're give, if, you, if you pay attention to yourself and take care of yourself, you don't care enough about, about this issue, about climate, um, or whatever, you know, issue you were doing. So this debate between external versus internal work, I just want to point out that I just utterly reject it. Um, and then I draw on in the book a lot of arguments and a lot of social movement leaders in the past who have said things like Audre Lorde has said, self-care is a radical act of revolution. It's not, um, it's not indulgent. So why do we need this not indulgent kit? Um, I had to go and do all this research, and this is like a little window into my bookshelf that I enjoyed when I was on a sabbatical to write this book, which um, I really love reading, and so I finally got to just dive into all this. It was a completely new take, new direction for me to go. And I was looking at research that I never thought I'd look at before on things like um, environmental spirituality, things like movement, social movement theory, social movement biographies. How do these people who have suffered in the past before get through ch challenging times? Um, theories about uh, resilience and how important internal resilience is for supporting societies. Um, all the different roles around thinking, you know, diving into how it is that emotion helps us do actions around climate. Okay, so then this is the this is my um, table of contents, and I'll just spend a little time um, for this last like quarter of this talk, go going into a little bit of these chapters that are highlighted here. Um, these, are, these are the toolkits, and they are all in the imperative verb form, do this, do that. Right? Um, but uh, they're all really aimed at absolutely dismantling that list of all those terrible things that, I was, that the slide earlier said, how does it feel to grow, come of age at the end of the world, and that had all those awful feelings. This book is meant to challenge all of that, and all of these chapters challenge each of those things. Um, so, yeah, if any of these are particularly interesting to you in Q&A, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But first, the one chapter I just want to spend two seconds on, kind of the shortest chapter is this um, second one on getting schooled on the role of uh, motion and climate justice. And as we have seen, the role of the narrative of urgency and the affect or the emotion of anger and righteousness has been extremely successful for Greta Thunberg, for the youth climate movement. And I love the movement. I think it's fantastic. But I am concerned about the long-term viability of this emotional resource for the climate movement, and especially for young people. 
what has actually happened to Greta Thunberg to get her to this place has not been something I would want young people to go through. And what has happened for a lot of activists to get this angry is not something that we should be getting to that state, stage with. And that's kind of why I want to write this book. It's awesome she's angry and she's being effective. But anger, and it, anger is a very important emotion. There's a lot of politics around anger. There's great books on anger. But long-term anger is a recipe for burnout for the individual and not for strategizing. So I also wanted to point out that in the book, I talk about the relationship. It's oftentimes, people often think that you're supposed to replace negative, so-called negative feelings like anger or guilt or apathy or fear with like Pollyanna, rose-tinted glasses, hokey hope, just everything's just gonna be all right and great and fine and carry on and let's just get rid of that stuff and move on to this other stuff and just have this. And that is not at all what I'm trying to argue in my book or suggest to you today, that these kinds of feelings are part and parcel of each other. They're two sides of the same coin. And that one of the things that emotional intelligence tells us and thinking about climate wisdom is that you are angry because of something that you love. And to think about how we can attend to the things that we love and not just only operate in a state of anger and focus some of that anger towards protecting the love, the thing that you love, is super important as a part of the strategy of this toolkit. Um, it turns out um, Adrian Marie Brown also has written a beautiful book called Pleasure Activism, uh, talking about the role of pleasure in making sure people stay in activism for the long term. Of course, there's that famous Emma Goldman quote of she's, um, attributed to say that if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. So there's this notion that if it's pleasurable, like building community and being together and celebrating and eating while you're doing the activism, then you will keep coming back to it. And so the science is out there. This is not about choosing one or the other. The science is out there that the feelings like guilt and fear and anxiety are likely to, more likely to shut you down from the work than to keep you going in the work. And so you ought to do some effort, some interior work, to work your anger and your fear and your guilt into some of these other places. Maybe four days a week, and the other three you could feel anger, right? I mean, like nudge in the direction, right? And she does this too. She'll tell you that. I'm not suggesting that Greta Thunberg operates from anger all the time. Um, so I wanted to give an example of what are some of the problems with thinking about urgency and fear as your kind of modus operandi, your affective state for doing activism. Um, we've got a, a, has anybody heard of this Terra Gen issue going on in Humboldt County? <laughs> it's a real local issue for me. I want to bring it to your guys' attention. Um, happening right as we speak, a wind co power company wants to put a wind farm up on we ought territory land, sacred land, and the argument for doing so, of course, is urgency, urgency, climate change, COP25 just told us we gotta do this. Why are these indigenous people getting in our way doing this? Why would people think this way, right? So the climate change, the urgency of climate change narrative can actually circumvent, foreclose, stop good conversation around with questions of social justice that are actually at the center of climate justice. So I really want us to be very careful about the narrative of urgency, what it's doing to us, our long-term engagement with the movement, but also in terms of our ability to deal with, to center social justice in doing climate work. So this age nine girl has drunk the Kool-Aid, right? The climate change anxiety Kool-Aid, right? And that's, that's, that's a problem, it's a problem for her, Right? And it's also a problem for developing this just world that we want to live in, right? Manifesting this world. Um, chapter four, claim your calling and scale your action. One of the things, this, student, this notion that young people are powerless to do anything about this is really something I'm trying to tackle in this book. And it doesn't take much to go and get, take a page out of the book of uh, social movement organizing strategies. It's all available online because they want people to have access to it. It's open access, unlike academics, which is not. You can go to social movements and get all the tools you want to teach yourself and your friends and your students or whoever you're with how to map your power, map your skills, map your networks, map your, resource, your support networks, map your resources, map your spheres of influence. Also find out the places that you have gaps in your knowledge and gaps in your skills so you can go and fill them. This is awesome to do collectively. Amazing things happen. 
oh, what, that's so funny, because classrooms are these collective spaces. Wow, it's awesome. Like, things happen in, in, when you get people together in the same space. Avoiding the apathy, apathy trap, which convinces you that the problem is too big and you're too small. And so this is this notion that you're just one little drop in a bucket. And in my book, I give you like a million reasons why that's not true. And hope that you'll just go read the book. But this is a myth. This is a myth. We buy the myth that we are powerless, and we sacrifice our power in doing so. That is what Rebecca Solna calls the privatization of the imagination, which is this notion that every, the people in power want you to believe you have no power. But if you actually go and read about how social change happens, you will see, like Margaret Mead has said, it has only ever been a small group of engaged citizens that make ma major change happen. That's not exactly what she said, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, relatedly, I really think it's important to, for us to expand our notion what, as what counts as action. We often think of action as a spectacular thing, like someone won an election, or someone toppled a dictatorship, or a wall was broken down, or something. Social change happens in these spectacular events that the news covers. But if you study social change, you realize that actually change happens in these slow, gradual, unglamorous committee meetings, baking cooking sessions, where things are happening that don't feel like they're actually getting anywhere. This notion of slow change or unglamorous change does not really make it into the media as positive news. Um, rejecting the myth of, of individualism, we talked a little bit about it, but this notion that you are only an individual and so therefore you can only make change as an individual is the way the world, our country would like it to be that way, right? That, that has a lot of positive value in it too but it has us all thinking that we are just acting as individuals. Um, and the myth of instrumentalism is something that I really got out of move, social movement theory, this notion that you will only feel engaged in the work if you can see that it's having an effect. And I think that's a really dangerous expectation around social, social change and social movements. And most of the folks who've been in, involved, these biographies I've read about social change leaders, will tell you, if you want that to happen, then forget it. So just let it go. You can bake cookies and bring it to the class. And that is action. That's impact. You will never be able to measure the impact of that. OK, so that's like an example of that chapter. The hack the story chapter is the last one. You might be surprised to learn that 80% of the media coverage on climate change is in the negative frame. So what does that mean? That's not like. I'm not saying they're saying climate change doesn't exist. I'm saying they're saying it's a bad thing, it's doom and gloom, it's awful, it's awful, it's awful. This seems obvious to you, right? But what you might not be so obvious and I got to do research on is that the negative frame is deliberate. It is not necessarily truth. There are reasons why the media present things in the negative frame. It is because human beings in general, and the, the, the money will tell you that this is true, just follow the money, want to see negative news. Some would argue, social psychologists would argue, evolutionary psychologists would argue that this is because it was a residual evolutionary thing that we like to look at negative things to keep ourselves surviving, right? Even if you don't believe that, go believe the, the you know, GDP bottom line economic situation of the news media outlets that prove that people consume negative news. It is like a dopamine hit thing, like the, the rats in the thing, you know what I mean? Like more, more, more. I, it is for me, I do, I'm like, oh, it's terrible, terrible, more of that, please. Narratives of doom and gloom have historical con and cultural context are not just truth. And so this is where the tool of discourse analysis that I got from my humanities training has come in really helpful. Um, Asking questions like who's telling these stories, what is their agenda, and who benefits from its implications, these are all things you're doing in college, right? Being critical of nar critical narratives. But I would go the next step further and say go on a media diet, right? Don't even consume that stuff. Instead, creating stories and cultivating a radical imagination, for example, imagining what that post-fossil fuel society might look like that you've helped create. Joanna Macy calls it the great turning is a crucial task of the climate generation. So the, the radical imagination is a really important part of doing this work. 
Make a habit of collecting and sharing stories to counter the negative news bias, which champion solutions, talk about people coming together, show examples of resilience. They're not uh, packageable in dominant news media sources. How do we retell those stories? How do we lift those stories up and show examples of that? Not because we're trying to say it's all hunky-dory, we don't have to do anything more because look at all these other great people doing it, but because the science shows us that if we see other people doing it, we are more likely to do it ourselves. In the, quite, you might assume that if we tell positive stories, it's going to let people off the hook and make them lull, lull into complacency. But actually, social psychologists tell us, no, actually, it makes people do more. They realize they're part of a community. They're part of the blessed unrest, as Paul Hawken calls it. So ultimately, this chapter is uses this, the psychology to say that stories that leave us feeling urgency, despair, hopelessness, guilt, or fear are bad for us, bad for social justice, and bad for the planet. So if you want to fix the planet's problems, don't consume these stories. It's an existential toolkit idea, right? It's also super important to recognize as yourself as a story producer. Every time you put something on Facebook, every time you send an image out there, every time you like something, you are moving stories in different directions. You are creating and helping to manifest a story. So you are storytellers already. So take responsibility for that. Which side of the story do you want to perpetuate? The 80% already doom and gloom? Or do you want to counterbalance that with something else? Um, okay, so for some reason it's doing that again. Oh, and again, <laughs> sorry, I don't know why that did that. Um, so I recently just spoke to some students about this, and um, she sent me a note saying, I really like what you had to say about the urgency narrative and how it can be dangerous. This is something I've started to be very worried about as a sort of climate apocalypse narrative is being picked up more and more, not just by activists, but by news sources. I'm afraid it will make people complacent and powerless or push people towards solutions that are actually harmful. I'm afraid of the right wing co-opting this kind of language and what they might do with it. So I don't know if you heard that analysis of the shooting in El Paso, but there was the note by the shooter that talked about the climate problem as one of the reasons why we need to get rid of some people on this earth. Right? So this co-opting of the urgency narrative could be very dangerous indeed. I've been thinking a lot about what you said about the importance of telling news stories. I feel like the news stories I'm starting to appreciate are all about things that take a lot of time, like building community. It is sometimes hard to notice or promote these slower things when the overwhelming narrative is, we need to get this stuff done ASAP, but they are essential. So I thought, oh, that student says it better than I said it in the book, so I want to put it out there. So I just want to end on saying what my hopes are for the climate generation. For sure, it's to challenge all of that stuff that I pointed out are the things that it feels like to come of age in the climate generation, those things are not necessarily true. That is the dominant story you've been given. Also, I would encourage you to take as much energy and time as you think you ought to be spending convincing other people to care about this stuff and put the same amount of time or more into cultivating personal resilience in dealing with these problems because you're, the plant's gonna need you for the long haul. It's not just something that we can have a big flame out of activism and it be fixed. This is a long-term issue. So putting as much energy towards pre preserving yourself for this work in the long haul is really important. So thank you. Do you not feel like there's some sort of importance to the climate anxiety? Because sometimes when I wake up, I'm like, I need to be feeling some sort of passion and drive. And not to say that anxiety is a positive thing, but it's kind of getting everybody going and it's sort of jostling things up in a way that I don't think my parents experienced or any previous generations. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, I totally agree with your assessment of this generation. And uh, I felt like when I was young, there was no cause to get behind. I felt like everything was gray. There's no real right or wrong. There's no good and evil. You know, it's kind of like, uh, Star Wars seemed like a nostalgic thing. Like, oh, forces of evil, ugh, that's awesome. Can we have some of that? Um, and so it seems pretty, pretty clear to us now, I, at least to me, that young people are pretty convinced that there's a, there's a, a side of history that they want to be on for this, and it's really motivating them. And my assumption and my intended audience for this book is people who have already been dealing with the anxiety for a long time. 
and who need some other tools. I am, this is not for people who are, you know, already happily moseying along in ignorant bliss and who need some other reason to not care about the climate. <laughs> yeah. um, it strikes me that, one, we are all the climate generation. I, I don't mean that dismissively, but I mean I'm very much part of it. I'll die of old age before climate takes the lives of the younger people. I acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> I also think of all of our non-human brothers and sisters and the, create, the, the connection with the rest of creation. I haven't heard you address that yet, and I wonder mm. if you've considered it. Yeah. Um, I hadn't really considered it in the context of climate anxiety. Um, in the context of the answer I just gave to this student, when Kimmerer could explain to me that my act of consumption of something as insignificant as a ballpoint pen, which she describes buying at the store, as if it just came off the back of Santa's sleigh. That's how she describes it. You pick up this ballpoint pen from the store as if it was just a gift to you, you know, from, no from nothing. Rather, to see how it connects with and impacts and has had an impact on a whole ecosystem of human and more than human creatures and entities. That is what I think she means by practical reverence. And to me, that works. But I, am, I don't spend a lot of my time thinking about the argument that non-human or the more than human um, needs to have people speak for them or have rights or whatever the discussions are around all those things. Um, I'm less interested in that conversation, although lots of people think that's a really important conversation. That's awesome, love it. Um, but I'm more interested in what is the affect that's going to make people think about those relationships with those other things. And it's, it could be different for lots of different people. For some people, it's sheer cuddly cuteness of charismatic megafauna, right? The polar bears. But I don't think that's a necessarily great affective reason to care about other critters. So, you know, I'm, I'm empathy it gets, gets criticized as being a kind of um, per, um, anthropomorphism of assuming that animals are like humans. I don't, you know, I don't really want to get into thinking about that. I don't particularly think that that's necessary for an ethical orientation to the more than human world. Does that make sense? It's not a great answer. I appreciate that, though. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let's, um, let's thank uh, Dr. Sarah Ray. Thank you. Thank you.